This is literally the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Evening Jones. Watch that at TheEveningJones.com. Need you to log in, use whatever kind of profile you got. Go ahead and do that once you do. You can participate in our chat room. You can also send in your questions. Type them out, put them up on the screen. I will answer them. I want to show you something. I think I had noticed this before, but I don't really be caring. But I had a moment where I was like, yeah, I'm my dad. And every now and then this happens to you as you are a growing young boy. You just have moments where you pop up and you realize that you're your dad. And you may be wondering, like, what was it that made me realize I was my dad? It was when I put on this hoodie. It's probably a little too small. And the sleeves are definitely a little too short. And I just looked at myself and said, just got to roll them things up. <laughs> All of a sudden, sleeves ain't too short. In fact, the problem in the beginning was probably that the sleeves were too long. And thought about it like that, had you? I feel like I can't have the only uh, father who put them on to that game. Y'all daddy ain't put y'all up on that game. Right, my man Matt in the chat room said it's lanky man problems. It's absolutely correct, man. Like them shirts that you're getting from the very beginning, they already struggling. They holding on to just be long enough for what you need. You know what I'm saying? And all it takes is a little bit too long in the dryer. And then next thing you know, you got that gap. That's right. Ain't really a whole lot of solutions that you got when it come to your pants. Unless you just one of them dudes that roll up the ankles on his pants. And I mean, I wasn't raised that way either. But these sleeves, like this is a real live occupational hazard of being taller than the average man. Which, of course, absolutely beats the alternative. I recognize and fully understand that we are not supposed to live in a world where we shame short people. And I'm not ever going to shame people simply for being short because I recognize that it is beyond their control. And I certainly recognize that it is not the way that they prefer for it to be. I can just tell you that at the end of my 10th grade year of high school, I was five foot four. By the end of my freshman year of college, I was six foot four, at least in the media guide. And for purposes of this discussion, I did grow a full foot because I definitely had to have been exaggerating to get myself to the five four. Anyway, I grew that full foot. And let me tell you something. Life's a lot better from up here. They treat you different. All the days. They all treat you different. I don't, I don't know why. It's not really my place. It's not really my explanation. I, I really don't know, right? So I just want to make sure that you understand, because I imagine there's a couple of little fellas that's listening to this right now and hearing me complain about some of the occupational hazards of being tall, right? Well past that magical 5'9 height that so many of these gentlemen wish that they could get to and then claim to be quote unquote average. I understand where it is you cats are coming from. I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate my privilege as a tall person. I absolutely do. I totally appreciate, I know what it is, right? I don't want you to think that I am complaining about this bountiful world that you wish that you were a part of. I don't ever want you to feel that way. I want you to know that every day that when I'm out here taking these long strides, I know you had to take two. I get it. You got to take two steps for me to t when I take one. I imagine that the bright side is as a result, you are in superior cardiovascular condition to me. Because I know, man, it's hard work being a short man. I get that. So anyway, like I was saying, what y'all don't know nothing about, you little homies, the rest of us can talk about, is them sleeves that all of a sudden you look down and they be riding up. And either you're just going to be buying shirts all the time or you're going to come up with that solution. And that solution is rolling it up. And you know what the roll up makes people not think? That's right. You be out here working hard. You out here sending a signal that you are not resting on the laurels of being a tall person. Nah, you roll your sleeves up and you get to business. Problem with this sweatshirt is I just roll the sleeves up like that. And shit, man, it get even a little tight at the forearms. Like... I was feeling a little circulatory malfunction going on there. Somebody over here said, relax with the little homie. I think the little homie needs to relax.
How about that? Uh, this dude up here talking about plenty of MMA fighters and soccer players under 5'11". We can fight and run better. Man, you better get the we the fuck up out of there, Kevin Malloy. Because if you could fight, you wouldn't be talking about MMA fighters doing it. You would be doing it yourself. That's right. If you could run, you would be running up on me. But you not. You just over there in them size 34, 30 jeans. Anyway, let's move on to your question. Somebody over here said, being tall in the Navy is boo-boo, though. Always hitting my head on shit. Yeah, buddy, that's kind of thing to make you wish you had studied a little bit harder. All right, first question. What did you think of Judas and the Black Messiah? Um, shout out right fast, by the way, to everybody who came to my little clubhouse room that I had with the homie Michael Smith. I don't really be all clubhouse like that, so I can tell you to go follow me, but you ain't going to see very much of me. And as I think we have previously discussed here, last thing I feel like doing is here, having more places to hear the shit y'all got to say. <laughs> no disrespect. You know, but I feel like I've seen plenty and heard plenty from y'all. I don't need more. But anyway, Judas and the Black Messiah. All right, you guys know me, right? I am a little bit of a wet blanket when y'all get all hyped up about something. You know, whatever it happens to be, I tend to be that guy. Like that one night a Miami movie came out, I had to wait a little time before I came on here and talked about it because y'all don't really respond too well to your faves being subject to the critical eye that I occasionally possess. Y'all just want to make everybody a hater and just want to go in on Yes Queen and everything else, and that's just not really my wiring, all right? So you know, this is my wire. This is how I am. This is my background. You can take everything I say um, through that lens of understanding that people think I'm a person who gets off on not being easily impressed, okay? That's, that's me. Judas and the Black Messiah was great. Like, I didn't think it was good. I thought it was great. I certainly did not think it was perfect, right? I thought it had some flaws and had some places where it can be improved and some places where I didn't think, like, the imagery that they were projecting was necessarily properly in line with, like, the history and who all the people were. Um, but they were making a movie. And I think that's something that's key to remember on anything like this in the end is that they are making a movie. There are going to be sacrifices made with the truth in order to make for a better movie. This is not a historical rendering of the life of Fred Hampton. In fact, it is only one year in the life of Fred Hampton, and I think the most important point to make is a point that I've made before and a point that I'll make again and a point that I think is very important, which is this is not a movie about Fred Hampton. I would argue that The Last King of Scotland, which isn't really about Idi Amin, right? It's not really about him. But The Last King of Scotland is way more about Idi Amin than Judas and the Black Messiah is about Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton is an important and obviously central character to the movie, but this movie is about Bill O'Neill. And in fact, I saw an interview, I think it was with Shaka King, the director, where he made the point that Fred Hampton was a fully formed being. That does not make a very compelling protagonist. Protagonist in this movie is Bill O'Neill. You see the ups and downs of Bill O'Neill in a way that you really do not see with Fred Hampton. There is more of an emotional exposition of uh, Bill O'Neill than there is of Fred Hampton. Like, the movie isn't about Fred Hampton. So, like, if you came into this movie and came out of it being mad that they did not say more about, like, the life of Fred Hampton and that they did not tell a more like robust story about the life of Fred Hampton. Well, what you can do is go make your own movie. It's not the responsibility of these filmmakers to make every Fred. Look, I'm amazed that they got a Fred Hampton movie mad at all. I mean, made it all. I'm sorry. I can't like, whoa. Like, I feel like in order to get that done, you got to go in there and lie to those people. I hope that they don't actually read the shit. 
Like, that's nuts. They got Warner Brothers to make a movie that had Fred Hampton Jr. on the set for every shot. Like, when you really stop and think about that, that is bananas. Like, if anybody wants to, as much as I do not, like, like, we got a long ways to go as it goes to race in America. But there are moments that pop up where you got to be like, yo, we can't get out here acting like it's exactly the same. This will be one of those moments, all right? So, the movie is not about Fred Hampton. I, it's, I, people are like, it's a Fred Hampton biopic. If Fred Hampton's life was one entire year. I mean, come on, that's stupid. That's just not what this was, okay? It's a movie about O'Neill. And like somebody in the chat room said, it's a snitch movie. Yeah, that's a way to look at it. And I think that... The, the cruel irony of all of this for Bill O'Neill is that he did all this stuff to not do five years in jail. And he basically spent the second half of his life imprisoned. Imprisoned by the guilt hell, imprisoned by being in witness protection. Like, I mean, imprisoned by working for the FBI. He was in a different kind of jail. He was in that kind of jail the whole time. If he had just done them five years, and granted, it's easy for me to say if he had just done them five years, he'd have been a whole lot better off on the back end, though, in all likelihood, if he had done those five years. Like, you think about this. He said in that Eyes on the Prize interview um, that the FBI, because I, I felt like from the Eyes on the Prize interview, he had to do a lot to convince himself that what he did made sense. And I can totally understand why he would have to, like, how do you get through day to day? You do that basically set up Fred Hampton to die. He had to convince himself that what he did was okay. And so it sounded like he talked himself in a lot of ways into a lot of places. And, of course, I think he sounded ridiculous, but it came up on this dude when he was 17 years old and leaned on him with jail time. And they were like, yeah, but you got to sell dope for us. I mean, that's basically what they did. And... I understand all you gangsters out here in the streets wouldn't have done it, but a whole lot of people would have. And it seemed like it like snowballed into something that the dude at least has portrayed in the movie. He didn't think it was going to be that. And it did turn into that. You know, so I thought that they created a human figure in O'Neill, and I'm okay with that because O'Neill is a human being. It also a snitch. Like, yo, I mean, you were you you had a role in something incredibly dastardly. I could understand how a whole lot of people could have wound up in the exact same situation. I can. But you the one who did it. Damn. And by the way, just in case you need to know what kind of like guilt and everything else have been torturing Bill O'Neill, you know, they said I talked about how he killed himself the day that Eyes on the Prize interview aired. The dude ran onto the interstate to kill himself. Like, he had a lot going on. Appreciate the question. Let's see what else we got here. Somebody's question is, any traumatic Valentine's Day memory for childhood? You fucking idiot. If I did have a traumatic Valentine's Day memory from childhood, why would I want to tell you? Lance, find Kingsley and get him up out of here. Good God, listen to this question. The Claremont School of Theology is facing severe financial problems and may close soon. Do you have any memories of the school and what would be your advice to struggling small liberal arts colleges? Who has a memory of a theology school that they did not attend? Because let me tell you where I'm not going to look for girls.
Like, who, who, Man, some of these questions are just long. Listen to this one. Heard a story about Moses Malone saying Treasures in Houston was his favorite place to eat because he said it was the best buffet in town. Being from Houston, is there any validity to this? I left Houston when I was 16 years old. You question whether anything good comes out of talking about Rush Limbaugh. Should the media ask the question about talking Trump? Even with COVID and everything else, Trump is still topic 1A on most days. What I was talking about on Twitter today about Rush Limbaugh was a little bit different than what you're talking about with Trump. Now, do I think with Trump that like we don't really need to be talking about him that much on cable news? Absolutely. He is by and large an irrelevant figure right now. This is my point about Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh died today. We're taping this on Wednesday. Rush Limbaugh died today. A friend of mine sent me the link to say Rush Limbaugh died, and I said, oh, good time not to say anything. And so I rock, rocked with the idea that this was a good time not to say anything. Because I do... You'll have to be a spectacularly reprehensible person for me to shit on you the day you die, no matter who you are. I'm just not doing, like, that's just not, I can wait. It's not that important, right? And I am not that personally offended by Rush Limbaugh that I just felt the need to, like, piss on his grave on the day that he died. And a lot of other people did feel like they needed to piss on his grave on the day that he died. And if you have a different opinion about pissing on somebody's grave the day that they die, that's fine. I really don't care about that. What I was looking at and what made me get on Twitter and basically raise the question about whether or not, like, why are you even talking about Rush Limbaugh right now, is I look on my timeline and it seemed like people felt like they needed to make sure and be abundantly clear that no one lionized Rush Limbaugh in his death. And the way that they were going to stop lionizing Rush Limbaugh in death was to send out all these racist things that Rush Limbaugh has said in the past. And I got news for you. You're not about to change anybody's mind about Rush Limbaugh, and you're damn sure not going to do it on the day that he died. It's not going to happen. Furthermore, doing this on Twitter, where the overwhelming majority for most people, the people who follow them, are people who agree with them and agree with their worldview, you're not correcting the record. You're not changing anything. You're not having any influence on anything whatsoever and the people whose minds you're worried about you know reaching or trying to hit like forget about the fact that they don't care what you say they're not even gonna see what you say right and so what do i wind up with and this is me and my own timeline i'm not saying other people are responsible for this i'm just gonna tell you what i saw but what I then wind up with is a bunch of people regurgitating all these racist things that Rush Limbaugh has said, which means my timeline is just basically full of videos of Rush Limbaugh saying racist things. And by the way, nobody was like going in the vault. 
everybody was basically pulling up the same quotes and they were pulling up the same clips. And you know why they were doing that? Because the only time that these people actually think about Rush Limbaugh is when some website that they read pulls up a clip of one of the racist things that Rush Limbaugh has said. I understand completely and hear people who talk all the time, who talk in this context about, well, Rush Limbaugh delighted at our misery and da-da-da, so now we're going to delight in his death. Like, hey, doing shit for you. Like, if that's what you want to do, that's fine. I'm not even really getting on that judgment kick. I just want to make the point that y'all the ones that went to church and I'm the one with all the grace. Just a consideration. It's part of the reason that people buck back at you when you are not shitting on somebody after they die while they are doing it is they are trying to explain to you why it is okay for them to do it, which requires them to be mad at you for not doing it, but they need to explain why they're okay to do it because all of them were raised not really to do that. If not by people, then by faith. I'm not even judging you on that behalf. I'm just making the point that I understand why it is that people get so defensive when they out here shitting on somebody's grave and somebody else is like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, you know, now, now it's got to be a thing about that person because nobody wants to be the person that's shitting on somebody's grave. You just don't want to be in that place. But anyway, um, people, y'all ain't that mad about Rush Limbaugh. Y'all don't care that much about Rush Limbaugh. And you know how I know that you don't? I know that you don't because you don't listen to Rush Limbaugh's show. Like, I fully get and understand having an intellectual grasp and understanding of the damage that Limbaugh and his rhetoric has done in the country. Like, I totally get that. But don't you dare sit up here for a moment and have me pretend that Rush Limbaugh really got people this passionately upset about who he is. You're not. You're upset with the idea of Rush Limbaugh. But I'm telling you, none of these people have actually themselves consumed enough of Rush Limbaugh's content to have this level of anger about the fact that he died, that therefore they're going to spend the day just rattling off and being mad about Rush Limbaugh. Now, I do think that there are some white liberals who grew up like in the world immersed of that who might be in that place because they're riding in cars where they got to listen to it whether or not they want to. But a whole lot of black folks out here acting like they so damn mad at Rush Limbaugh are lying. Lying, I tell you, lying. Because they never gave Rush Limbaugh the time of day in the first place. Ask them people what radio station Rush Limbaugh came on in their country and they couldn't, in their city, and they couldn't even tell you. I'm not saying they should listen to Rush Limbaugh. I told you I listened to Rush Limbaugh once in my life. So I'm not even sitting here pretending like I'm some fan or anything like that. I'm just saying what wound up happening after he died in the discussion that people were having, they wound up promoting Rush Limbaugh's racism after Rush Limbaugh was dead. So like you think about this, if it was me and I decided to come out there and harvest the Rush Limbaugh quotes and to send them out, right? Now, I, I specify this to me because my job and the reasons that I am visible read a, reach a rather nonpartisan collection of people, right? Like I say, the people that follow me on the internet definitely lean farther to the left than to the right, but there are plenty of people to the right who do follow me and people in the middle because sports, right? It just goes all over the place. So anyway, if I get out here harvesting these Limbaugh quotes, I'm giving them oxygen. And I'm a person who will be giving them oxygen to a group of people that will either be emboldened or even potentially be like, hey, that was pretty funny stuff that Rush said. Right? So like for me, I'm like, I don't even know why I'm doing. Like there's no point in me getting out here talking about this. But for everybody else, I think it's fair to ask yourself the question, why are you doing this? Like, why would you spend any more effort in your day than you absolutely had to on Rush Limbaugh? Like, if you really find Rush Limbaugh to be so objectionable, so, 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 so objectionable that you think it's okay to, like, to piss on his grave at this point. And by the way, there's an argument for it, all right? I'm not necessarily saying you're wrong. All I'm saying is, if you that mad at Rush Limbaugh about this, then I imagine that you woke up every day happy that he was dying of lung cancer because something tells me that that's more miserable than the fact that he's dead. But you weren't waking up every day happy that Rush Limbaugh had uh, lung cancer. And you know why you weren't doing that? You weren't doing that because you don't spend no time out of your day actually thinking about Rush Limbaugh. But today... 
People going to try and explain to me that somehow there's some level of catharsis in bagging on Rush Limbaugh. No, nah, man. That's just unhappiness coming to the surface, and this is the vehicle for getting it out. That's what it is. I would have preferred, and I'm being totally selfish here, I would have preferred if people could have found a way to do it that didn't require me to have to relive all these Rush Limbaugh quotes all over again. And I don't think doing any of that and seeing them quotes and videos and looking at them as I know that many of y'all were doing, it ain't do a damn thing to make your day any better. What happened was Rush Limbaugh today became the kid in the cafeteria that everybody was going to pick on. So that was my point. Ask yourself why you would even give Rush Limbaugh attention, especially on the day that makes it the easiest to not give him attention because he ain't even here no more. And there was a story in uh, the New York Times very recently. It was called uh, the Cassandra of the Internet or something like that. And it was basically about this physics professor who had kind of predicted and like he coined the term the attention economy. And a big part of the concept in the piece was just this thought that Folks realize that attention is finite, and that's part of why it's so valuable, like from people in your own lives, is you recognize that attention is the thing that is like maybe the most precious and finite thing that people have to give. And so you recognize them giving your attention is them giving you like this precious resource. But what we've seen is that people on varying levels seek like all the attention that they can get, right? So this is my observation about the internet. The thing that makes the internet interesting is that you can give attention in small bits and sometimes in some cases give no attention while also then receiving all of the attention, right? Like you really capitalize on your minimal investment and in various ways, like going viral is getting all the attention, attention for very little of the work. And people love it when they go viral, you know? They like the idea that everybody liked the thing that they did or whatever, but anyway, People love this attention, and attention is becoming the currency of the day. But the, a point that stuck with me, though, was, and this is the thing that comes up with like all the notifications and social dilemma and all that stuff is, the amount of attention that each of us as individuals have to give, that's where it gets finite, right? If we all have a limited amount of attention that we can give with our waking hours, why would we choose to spend a significant portion of it talking about Rush Limbaugh when the best thing that ever could have happened was nobody talking about Rush Limbaugh? Like the thing about Limbaugh was Limbaugh on one hand was a person that we all needed to be aware of. But like somebody in my position, for example, if I were to go on a screed on Rush Limbaugh every day, I'm doing great business for Rush Limbaugh. Because that side thrives on knowing that they get some of my attention. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I spent the majority of my life and time not thinking a single bit about Rush Limbaugh. You, on your own, many of you, decided to spend this day giving him more thought than you have in 25 years. And while you were pissing on his grave, it was getting on your shoes and it was getting on my shoes too. So I would think and ask when these kinds of things come up, whether or not it might be a little healthier for us all to sometimes look up and realize, actually, I don't really be thinking about that person. And then go pay him dust. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Guys, I just need y'all all to know, you don't have to ask these long ass questions. You are not impressing me. Like this one question. Since the Judas and the Black Messiah trailer came out, they've announced series and or films about Muhammad Ali, Shirley Chisholm, Jack Johnson, Andre Day, and Andre Day, and several other black figures. Do you think we're going to start seeing a run on Hollywood making biopics about black figures? Why didn't you just ask the question? Did you go to Morehouse? 
Like, how many of you two, three-part people went to Morehouse? Can they teach them how to do that over there? Did you catch the Texas mayor having to resign for telling people to find their own electricity and water? Yes, I did see that story. I would first like to tell you guys something that you may not have known as you have seen the name of that town written down. It is pronounced Colorado, Texas. C-O-L-O-R-A-D-O, -O, Colorado. Thought I'd put you on to that game. Anyway, yeah, here's the thing about this mayor of this little town. And he got up and he put some post up on Facebook about only the strong survive and that if you ain't got no electricity or no water, oh, well, you just got to hunker down and we'll see you on the other side or maybe we do not, right? The real moral of the story here is, do you know anything about, like, who the mayors are of small towns? Like, you guys have to understand, anybody, anybody, can be the mayor of a small town. Like this dude says, because Texas, there is a mayor in every single one of the 50 states. There's probably a mayor, one mayor in 75% of the counties in America who would say something like this, because any old body can become the mayor of a small town. And you know the number one reason that you can be the mayor of a small town is if you're willing to do it. Like, that, that, that has to sound like one of the more annoying jobs in the world to you, right? Like, can you imagine for the little bit of money that they pay people to be the mayors of these small towns? By the way, many of them often have their own jobs. Like, it, you got to be such an idiot to do that job in the first place. So, like, yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all that that man said that. I am not. I also doubt very seriously that that man has the power to, like, actually make anything happen. Like, they're going to get a new mayor in there. They're still going to be in there cold as hell. Appreciate the question. Oh, wow, I'll take this one. I see people using Thomas Sowell quotes to discount the concept of systemic racism. It all seems like bad faith arguments to me. Don't know enough about him really to have a strong opinion. Thoughts, question mark. First of all, ask a... God, y'all are so bad at asking questions. I realize I ask you to ask questions, and then all I do is get on here and complain about how bad you are at asking questions. But I think you guys can understand where I'm coming from. I'm trying to make your lives a bit easier. Anyway, this is what I will tell you about Sowell, who is like legitimately bright and legitimately brilliant all right i don't agree with him in much of the world but like as an objective statement he is a brilliant dude um i'll just tell you this it doesn't happen as much as it used to on the internet but it used to happen more and it's happened a couple times in real life and i feel like there's going to be some people who are hearing this who know the kind of conversation that i'm talking about and what will happen is you'll have some white man who will tell you I just wanted to tell you that I really appreciate your work. And while I don't always agree with you, you always make me think I can tell that you are open minded and, you know, free to express, you know, all that kind of stuff. And with that in mind, I was just wondering, how do you feel about Thomas Sowell? Like whenever there is some conservative white man who really, really, really likes me, and is like pretty well read and all this, you know, on all that stuff. They are quick to ask, what do you think about Thomas Sowell? That is the one they go to. I remember once reading some essay that Thomas Sowell wrote about how the problem that um, the, the South's problem is that it has redneck culture and he went so far as to refer to, like, the way people speak. And you're thinking, of course, he referred to the way people speak. But, like, he used the oratory of 
Martin Luther King as an example of the redneck culture. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. And no, Connor, Soul is an economist. Appreciate the question. Wow. What a... Listen to this question. In your opinion, what makes Stringer Bell more worthy of immediate grave pissing than Rush Limbaugh? That's, that's an actual question that somebody asked me. And I want to just take a little time before I answer it. And I'll go ahead and put it on the screen or just make sure it gets caught in the record somehow so that everybody understands this. And what makes Stringer Bell more worthy of immediate grave pissing than Rush Limbaugh is he's not a real person. This is literally the dumbest shit I've ever heard. Like, I gave you all that time and all that explanation and everything that I was talking about. And by the way, said I did not really pass judgment on you for wanting to piss on Rush Limbaugh's grave. And then the dumbest person in the world had to come in and ask a question. You recently said when in college, be nice to the food employees because they will hook you up. What's the best hookup you ever got by simply being nice? I want to be clear. I said be nice to the food employees because that's what you should do. Um, you will also get hookups. But my point when I said that was that even the most cynical among us, they spend their time trying to kiss up to people who ain't actually got any power to influence their lives. Uh, but the best hookup I think I ever got for being nice, I never found out exactly who did it, but I once missed a flight. I was flying from California to Atlanta, and I overslept, and I missed my flight, and I went in, and I think I was being very, very nice about it because I remember I knew what my uh, seat number was, and I didn't think about the fact that I had changed flights. And so I get on the plane, and I'm in like 16D or wherever row my ship was supposed to be in, and uh, somebody came and said that they also had 16D. And I was like, oh, that's strange. And then I looked down at my boarding pass, and that thing said 4E. And I was like, 4? And I started walking all the way to the front, and I get to 5, and I'm like, yo, 4 is on the other side of the curtain. That was what was up. Appreciate that question. Let's see what else we got here. How long do you usually give a black owned business to deliver your goods or run your money? Just got my small business Saturday merch last week. Do you give us more grace with your money? Nope, I sure don't. And the reason is I've run small business myself. I know the pressures of small business, but I know for me, at least personally, every time I got behind, it was my fault. Now, please understand, white folks be out here getting behind too. And that's what I do. I'm treating everybody the same. I'm the future. Appreciate the question. See what else we got here.
Somebody really came in here with your thoughts on the impact of Rush Limbaugh on talk radio. First of all, ask a question, fool. Second of all, no. This guy's question. You got something against Arkansas? Sir, you ever been there? Like, I feel like you're asking me this because you are from Arkansas. So I'm assuming that you've been to Arkansas before. Have you ever left? Because I feel like when you leave, you're going to realize other places ain't like that. And I ain't talking about going to Mississippi. I mean, going to some other places than that. You had to choose between being a foot taller or a foot shorter. Which one would you go with? I would probably go with a foot shorter under those circumstances. I mean, with my naturally slim physique, if I'm a foot shorter, I mean, I can go ride horses, right? Like, I'd be reading about all the stuff that them cats got to go through so they can keep making weight and everything else. You know what I'm saying? That wouldn't apply to me. It was five foot four too tall to be riding horses. I feel like five four is a little too tall for that, yeah. But yeah, I'd rather be a foot shorter than B7-4. Being 7 4 would cost too much. 5 4, at least I can go to like Baby Gap and get clothes. You know what I'm saying? 7 4, they don't make a big and tall section that expansive. Was there any sort of punishment Amy Cooper could have gotten that would have been deemed acceptable to people? No, there is not a punishment other than jail and sending her to jail for what she did would have been ridiculous. Like I saw the story came out that that's the lady with the dude, the birder or whatever it was in Central Park, you know, called she called the cops on him and that was all messed up and everything. Um, and I ain't really out here to like put on no cape for her, but you don't, ain't nothing to go to jail for. So if that wasn't nothing for her to go to jail for, like what did people think the law was going to do? Like, what did you expect? So, no, there's nothing that could have happened because there's no online currency for, yeah, that seems appropriate. There's not. There's online currency for being mad that this woman had her charges dropped, even though this is the game. They ain't got time to be processing her case. Like, this is only a job for the cops because she called the cops. The consequences of her actions came from the rest of us. And I think we more than did our jobs. All right, getting to the end on this and see what else we got. Yeah, this will be the last question here. Do you think it's inappropriate for rappers to use Kobe's death as a punchline? I'm not sure what I think is inappropriate to use as a punchline as long as it's dope. 
I'm sorry. I am of a different era. This is this is no such question. When I was a kid, I, I, a punchline. No, please. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm from a different era of rap. I don't I don't think in those terms. Like I think it'd be hard to make that one deep. I mean, make it really bang. But hey, man, whatever. It's fair game, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Evening Jones. We try to do this thing about once a week. My man Lance Gilliam handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Remember, if you can't watch the Evening Jones live, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe at the iTunes store. Subscribe at Stitcher Radio. Check us out at SoundCloud. We are at Google Podcasts, and we are on Spotify. Take it easy.